Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Alex Chin. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here at NDC Oslo. Apparently, Snoop Dogg has also performed at this theater, so I'm walking among the greats. Also, I quit smoking cigarettes yesterday, so I'm feeling a little funny, so I apologize if I'm not super on top of my game. Um, <laughs> In this talk, I mentioned sexual harassment, sexism, racism, depression, and addiction. So feel free to skip it if that's what you need to do. I'm about to get very real and honest with everyone. I hope that's OK. I'm going to tell you the story of how shaving my head made me a better programmer, sort of, not really, and um, all the lessons I've learned along the way and then since then. I'm from Paris. I was born and raised there. Bonjour. Any French people? No? OK. I moved to the US to go to college, and that's where I learned to code. I wanted to be an astronaut, so I joined the engineering program at my school. And one of the requirements for the program was to take intro to programming in Python, so I did. And I fell in love with it immediately. It was like nothing I'd ever experienced. I felt like I could be creative and analytical all at once. I felt like I'd finally found a form of art with which I could express myself. So I started programming, and I decided to major in computer science, and that was a very easy decision. But staying in computer science was not so easy. And it wasn't because learning to code is hard, which it is. It's a lot of dealing with your computer telling you you failed over and over again. But that wasn't the hard part. The hard part was overcoming other people's perceptions and my own perceptions about my abilities as a programmer. At the time, I was one of maybe five women in my computer science classes. There were some classes uh, where I was the only woman. And there were very, very few people in my classes who hadn't been coding since they were 10 years old. And even though I did well in all my classes, no one wanted to work with me or talk to me. It was very lonely. It felt like I was hyper visible and invisible at the same time. And this was before all of the recent scandals came out, before the Me Too movement, before people started talking about tech's lack of diversity, before there was really a shared language around it. So it was my first year in college, and computer science really didn't seem like the place for me, even though I loved it. People didn't really believe I was a programmer. They would say to me, prove it. Do you know what the command line is? Which is a ridiculous question. But it wasn't just the students. One of my male friends told me that our computer science professor said this to him. So when are you going to fuck Alex? So my peers didn't see me as a programmer, and my professors didn't either. But it wasn't just them. I didn't believe in myself. Until my last year of college, when people would ask me if I was a programmer, I would say, well, not really, but I'm trying to become one. Which is silly, because the act of programming is what makes you a programmer. But I'm really stubborn, so I decided I was going to be a good programmer in a way that would be unquestionable to the world. So I joined my school's competitive programming team. Any other competitive programming nerds out there? Yes, OK. <laughs> and became a leader for our school's computer club, and took all the hardest computer science classes, and won a bunch of hackathons, and I finally became accepted by my peers. And it's ridiculous that for other people, all they had to do was show up and look nerdy, and I had to do all this work. But I made it, so it didn't seem to matter. Then I graduated with a degree in computer science in 2013, and I started my career as a software engineer in New York. This photo was taken in front of the McDonald's by Yankee Stadium, because that's where we had our graduation ceremony. And though I had experienced some discrimination in school for being a woman in the computer science department, I was not prepared for what was about to happen in the tech world. And some of it was small stuff, like microaggressions, like people asking me over and over if I was sure I was a programmer. But there was also some scarier, more serious, more traumatic incidents, like what we've seen has happened at Uber or other companies in the news. And I'm going to tell you about some of these incidents. And I used to give a version of this talk where I didn't mention these incidents, because I was speaking to a lot of young women, and I didn't want to discourage anyone from entering the tech field. But now I think it's important to share these. I found a draft of a blog post that I wrote after these incidents happened when I was 22 years old, and I never published it. I'm going to read the first few sentences of that blog post now. I didn't want to have to write this. I didn't want my first blog post to be about this. I wanted it to be about something technical, like browser compatibility or accessibility or anything else. But I can no longer keep silent. And it's not because I can't bear to hold this in, but rather because you all need to hear this. I used to be one of those women who believed that all that mattered was my code. I didn't want to identify as female developer. I just wanted to be a developer. 
And it goes on. I never published this blog post because I was too afraid at the time, but I'll share these stories today. Five stories that made me want to quit programming. At my first software engineering internship, I was the only woman on the engineering team. And a few weeks into the job, the QA lead asked me to get coffee. I was new and he was nice, and so I said yes. As we were getting coffee, he started asking me personal questions. Like, where do you live? What trains do you take to work? Do you have a boyfriend? Does he get jealous? Do you dress sexy for him? Do you wear lingerie for him? And so on and so forth. It made me very uncomfortable. I didn't know what to do or say, so I just finished my coffee as quickly as possible and headed back to the office. After that, I locked myself in the women's bathroom and cried all afternoon. He kept trying to spend time with me after that day, but I was very nervous around him, and I really didn't like having to work closely with him every day. I was too scared to tell anyone because I was just an intern, but on my last day, I got the courage to tell the CTO what had happened. He was very surprised and saddened, and you know, he told me, but he's such a nice guy, and he assured me that he would make sure this didn't happen again. I later found out that he continued to harass and actually stalk women at that company, but you know, he was a really nice guy and a high performer. After that experience, I mostly wore jeans and t-shirts to work, and I stopped wearing makeup or perfume because I was afraid of getting that kind of attention again. After that, I got another job as a front-end engineer. That team was great, and even though I was the only woman on the team, I felt safe and supported, and I was doing a great job. We were part of a portfolio of companies, so I got to attend a lot of tech events and conferences. The job was awesome, but what happened at those events was not awesome. Soon after I joined, our team was invited to a networking event organized by our venture capital firm. It was a nice evening with an open bar, and after a few drinks, I started talking to another software engineer, and at one point during our conversation, he tried to kiss me, and I had to physically push him away. After that happened, I was pretty upset, but I tried to make the most out of the event, so I started talking to someone else, and after a while, he also tried to kiss me. So I had to physically push someone else away. And at this point, I was furious, so I yelled at him that this wasn't okay, and he told me I shouldn't be so stuck up, and I took it as my cue to leave the event. And after that, I was very nervous at events where alcohol was being served. A couple months later, our engineering team went to San Francisco for a programming conference. One of our investors was based in San Francisco, and he invited me to meet with him to talk about my work and my career and the company. He said I had a lot of promise, and I thought this was a really good opportunity for my career. You know, he was a successful investor. We met for dinner, and I quickly realized this was not about work. This was a date. I tried to steer the conversation towards work, asking him questions about the company, investing, taking notes on my phone, trying to send every possible sign that this wasn't a romantic situation without offending him. But he wasn't getting the hint, or maybe he was choosing not to. After dinner, he asked me to come home with him for champagne, and he really insisted. It was very hard for me to say no, given that he was one of our investors, but I successfully left. And after that, I was a lot less friendly with the men that I met through work. A couple months after that, I went to a programming conference in Mexico. It was a very fun conference. Everyone lived in little cabins by the beach. You shared a cabin with a few other people. There was a lot of drinking at this conference. One night, one of the conference speakers who was staying in my cabin let himself into my room very drunk. I was asleep. He woke me up and tried to convince me to let him sleep in my bed with him, saying he didn't want to sleep alone. I was really scared, but I eventually got him out of my room. The next day, I told the conference organizers what happened, and so they sent out a reminder about the code of conduct. I spent the rest of the conference locked in my room, angry, crying, not wanting to run into him. After that, my engineering team always sent a male chaperone with me to tech conferences. A few months after that, our company was growing, so we hired a new VP of engineering. He had never worked with a woman on his team before, and he was my new boss. And he would say things that were really hard for me to hear. He would make jokes about how women existed only to serve men. He would make comments about my appearance, telling me he didn't like the way I dressed or how I did my hair. One time, I was wearing all black, and he told me I looked like a mustard sandwich, which is, I think, because I'm Asian and my skin is yellow. I'm not sure. Um, when our CEO disciplined him um, for his behavior towards me, he apologized to me, and then he said that women in tech like the attention, which was not the case for me. He also said he wished we had more women on the team, but that would mean he would have to liar, uh, lower the hiring bar, which felt like a serious insult and is also very untrue. And although I was one of the first engineers to join the team and my code was all over the code base, he started pushing me onto smaller and smaller projects, giving me grunt work. At one point, I was asked to stop speaking during product meetings, 
because I intimidated the product lead, who was also a man. It became impossible for me to work there, and I ended up having to quit. It was just too hostile a work environment for me. But is it really quitting if you are pushed out? So after all these incidents of harassment, nowhere felt safe. Not my job, not the tech world, not even code. People were leaving sexist comments on my pull requests on open source projects. A real comment that I got. And all of this happened by age 22. I was one year into my career, and I was not fine. I became very depressed. I even tried to write a blog post about it, but I never published it. I felt like, why do I love programming if programming doesn't love me back? And I was just trying to do my job, do what I love, just trying to write code. And it was becoming impossible for me to do that. It was actually making me depressed. And it felt like maybe this should be the end of my career. And I seriously considered quitting programming. But like I said before, I'm really stubborn. So again, I tried to find a solution. I sought out my friends for advice, and I realized I only had male programmer friends. So I decided to meet as many women engineers as possible. I got friends to introduce me to the women that they worked with, and I went on blind coffee dates with a bunch of ladies. And I was looking for advice and looking to build a support network. And I asked them, what do I do? How do I survive in this field? I got a lot of different advice. One woman who had been a professional programmer for over 10 years told me that when she cut her hair short, she stopped getting sexually harassed at tech events. So I kind of tossed that to the side. This one male friend uh, told me, why don't you become a badass programmer, like these famous programmers that we know? Become known for your expertise, and then people will have to take you seriously. They'll have to treat you with respect. Basically telling me to lean in. And I thought, OK, I'll try that. So I started giving talks at meetups about things I'm very passionate about, the JavaScript programming language, web accessibility, and so forth. And it went really well. And for some reason, I was on the front page of TechCrunch for a day. That was a long time ago when we still read TechCrunch. Remember that? And I even got invited to speak at a big con uh, programming conference, kind of like this one, where people were flying from around the country to attend. They paid hundreds of dollars for a ticket. And I shared the stage with people I really respected, people who build the tools that I used every day. And I was certainly the youngest person on stage. I was 23. And I was talking about something I cared about, accessibility on the web. So I was really excited. I felt accomplished. I was badass. I gave my talk, and it went really well. But then the first thing I got asked afterwards was um, a gentleman in the audience asked me, how do I talk to women at bars? And I couldn't believe it. After all the work that I did to get there, even in the moment when my expertise was undeniable, I was literally on stage at a conference that he paid money to attend, teaching him things. Even then, I wasn't seen as a programmer. So I learned that being a badass doesn't help. After all this work, after leaning all the way in, I wasn't seen as a developer, not even a female developer, just female. And at this point, I was really angry. I was so sick of being treated this way because of my gender and my appearance. But I'm a hacker, so I decided to hack my appearance. I shaved my head. Just kidding, that's Natalie Portman. I shaved my head. <laughs> and the weirdest thing happened. Suddenly, overnight, I was a good programmer. I stopped getting sexually harassed at conferences. People listened to me and respected me. I stopped being this mix of hypersexualized and underskilled programmer. And I tried to think about it scientifically, like, is there something in hair that makes me worse at programming? Maybe my hair was weighing me down, like dragging my programming skills down. Maybe this is an aerodynamics problem, like how swimmers and cyclists shave their legs, you know? But that's not right, because this guy's a really good programmer. <laughs> that's Richard Stallman. And these guys are really good programmers, too. Um, they're Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie, the co-creators of Unix. And this guy's a really good programmer, too. Just kidding, that's Serial from the movie Hackers, which is a great film. I hope you all watch it. So it had nothing to do with my hair. But now, all of a sudden, I was seen as a good programmer. What had changed then, if not my actual skills, which definitely hadn't leveled up overnight? It was the way I was being perceived by my peers. I was no longer this hyper-feminine lady who didn't belong, and people even mistook me and my boyfriend at the time for a gay couple. And so I didn't present as feminine anymore, and so it was acceptable for me to be a programmer, and even a good one. And this was a mind-blowing discovery for me, because even though I knew that I was a good programmer in my heart, and I knew that sexism was a thing, now I really understood it and had proof of it on a personal level. So I realized the tech industry is not a meritocracy, unlike I initially thought, unlike many people had told me. 
This industry doesn't allow capable, passionate people like me to succeed regardless of their skills. It systematically pushes out women and gender non-conforming people, people of color, people with disabilities, etc. And I thought about the advice that people had given me, which was all about changing myself. They said, cut your hair, become a badass, be more of a bitch, learn to ignore it. And I thought, no, it's not me who has to change. It's the tech industry that has to change. So I was 23 and I decided that as long as I'm in this field, I will work to fix it, to make it more diverse, more inclusive, and better for all humans. So I started my quest to teach underrepresented and vulnerable populations to code so that we can change the face of technology, create pathways for economic mobility for communities that have been left out of tech, and to empower more of us to build the solutions to the problems that affect us instead of our fate being in the hands of others. I started telling this story and advocating for diversity and inclusion at tech conferences, and I became a teacher and an advocate for underrepresented people. I built tech education programs for people of color, people without college degrees, immigrants, women, and my students have gone on to do incredible things. Some of my Crystal Ray High students built an app that teaches young adults about affordable makeup and makeup styles for all skin tones with the goal of challenging white supremacist beauty standards. They went on to win multiple hackathons and even demoed their app at the EmojiCon conference. One of the students, Candy, started college at Stanford last year and is studying computer science there. I was the curriculum director at Coalition for Queens, a free programming school for adults from low income and underrepresented backgrounds where I helped launch the program. 50% of the class was women, 50% were immigrants, 50% had no college degree, 50% were black and Latinx. And the average income of the class when it started was about $20,000 a year, so below the federal poverty line in the United States. And graduates went on to work at the New York Times, Spotify, Buzzfeed, Vice as professional software engineers. And they're making, you know, in six figures now. One of the projects that came from this class was an Android app called Blazin, an online community of women, children, people of color, and LGBTQ folks that aims to combat street harassment. And Madeline, one of the students from the class, joined Pinterest and started Tecnolochicas, a group for Latinas in tech, and has become an icon and advocate for diversity in tech. I've mentored young girls in the worldwide technovation competition. For that competition, two of my high school students built an app that aims to reduce, reduce produce waste by connecting farms to restaurants so that farms can sell their ugly produce, which would otherwise be wasted. This is a big problem, food waste in the United States. It's an iOS app called Grow Green. Rachel on the left is now studying computer science at Yale University, and Priya on the right just graduated high school and is continuing to develop the app. She was named one of Crane's 20 under 20 last year, and she recently spoke at the Global Food Innovation Summit in Milan. I teach people to code as an ethical practice. This is a photo of some of my students. We're all wearing t-shirts that have the binary representation of the words, with great power comes great responsibility. And after all this teaching, I've learned three very important lessons about code. You shouldn't have to compromise on any aspect of your identity to do what you love. Some people have taken the wrong message from this talk, which is that you should shave your head to be a coder, no. Since shaving my head, I've had many different hairstyles. I wear it short now because that's how I feel. You should be able to just be you, no matter who that is, and write code safely. Two, excellence in code can come from anyone. Anyone can achieve excellence if they're given support, a safe space to learn, and if you trust that they can succeed. I truly believe this. I've taught people from age 12 to 63, from all socioeconomic backgrounds, races, countries, immigration status, gender and gender identity, and this is the truth. And these projects that my students have built, they're important, they're game changers. So we need technologists from diverse backgrounds if we have any hope for a brighter future. And it's because of these beliefs that I started my latest project. In 2016, I read the book The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander, in which I learned about how black and brown populations are disproportionately and unfairly criminalized and murdered in the United States, and how the system of mass incarceration is truly the latest iteration of slavery. I wanted to learn from people who had experience with the criminal justice system, so I started teaching people who had been to prison how to code. And that's how the Code Cooperative started. Now, over two years, two years later, we've become a community of people who learn, use, and build technology to create life-changing opportunities for individuals and communities that have been impacted by incarceration. We work for the liberation of all beings. We imagine and commit to building a world where our collective humanity is reflected in our technology, society, and policy. 
And we do this not just for the liberation of people who have been to prison, but for our own liberation and sense of justice, because no one is free until we are all free. And then last year, I finally got the courage to call out the men who had sexually harassed me at DockerCon in San Francisco and at some other conferences. And the talk made its way around Twitter. It was a beautiful moment of justice. And I felt like I was living my best life. I got everything I'd worked so hard for. I went from hello world freshman year of college to almost quitting the tech industry out of fear for my sanity and safety to making a place for myself within it where I was thriving and unafraid. I proved to the world I was excellent. I was fighting for the change I wanted to see in the world. And I was doing work I really believed in with people I cared about. There were a lot of labels I would use to describe myself at this point. Founder, director of technology, international public speaker, social justice warrior, badass, workaholic, party girl, coding icon. Actually, I would never call myself an icon. Someone else did. Bless their heart. So it looked like I was doing great on the surface, but something was catching up with me. Some shit you don't show on Instagram. Chronic trauma from repeated sexual discrimination and harassment, burnout, divorce, rage quitting job after job, losing work visas and a green card, self-medicating through the fear and pain with alcohol and other substances, and depression and suicidal thoughts. In my fight to be excellent, to be accepted, and to advocate for others like me and ultimately get revenge, I had lost a lot. All these years of trying to be the best, to be bold, to be perfect, had come at the cost of something I couldn't afford to pay anymore, my wholeness and freedom. And I couldn't keep doing it. So I did what people do after they get divorced. I took a sabbatical. This is a more accurate reference. Any BoJack fans? Cool. I decided to take a break from everything and try to heal. I started removing all of my distractions and coping mechanisms. I quit working, social media, dating, and I got sober. I stopped numbing myself and screening the world. And I was forced to sit with myself and with my feelings for the very first time and to reckon with the truth that I was not okay, that I had been harming myself for a long time and I hadn't been able to stop until I hit bottom. But I was on a new quest now, a quest to become whole and free. I learned to stop engaging in addictive, harmful behaviors one day at a time. Under those behaviors were some deep wounds that were created when I was just a child, wounds that I didn't even know I had until then. When I was very young, I learned that I was only worthy of love if I was perfect. And I realized that so much of what I was doing since then was in the pursuit of validation. I wanted the world to tell me I was worthy because I didn't believe it myself. And because this was the story I had told myself my whole life, it would take serious work to unlearn it. I learned to meditate and to practice mindfulness so that I would be able to change my thoughts. I started going to meetings with other people who are going through the same journey, trying to stay sober. And I shared with them all my challenges, my fears and my shame, and I listened to them share theirs. And after a while of doing this every day and saying things out loud I didn't even believe and crying more tears than I thought were possible to hold in one body, things started to move within me. I truly hacked my brain. I learned that feelings are temporary. Thoughts are not truths, beliefs aren't truths. And I can change my thoughts, my beliefs, and my behaviors. Using these tools, I've learned to stop causing harm to myself and others. I stopped drinking alcohol and doing drugs. I stopped reaching outside of myself for validation from work, success, or other people. I learned to practice honesty and authenticity instead of projecting to the world what I think will get me what I want, which is sometimes just as simple as being seen, being accepted, and belonging. I learned to let go of my personas one at a time. And I learned that I'm enough just as I am. And I started to make amends to the people that I had harmed. Friends, family members, coworkers, lovers. And through this process, I'm learning that I'm not the harms that I've done and what it means to be accountable to my actions and to work hard to make things right when I've done someone wrong. I learned what it's like to show up and sit in the discomfort and the pain to try to heal relationships instead of just walking away. I've learned to look someone in the eyes and say, I'm sorry for hurting you. How can I make it up to you? And I commit to doing things differently. And this has been really hard. And I wouldn't have been able to get through it without the support of people who don't judge me and who hold me accountable to my values. Over the past few months, I've sat in a lot of different rooms and listened to people share stories about where they are from and what matters to them. Through hearing all these stories, I've come to realize a deep truth that I relearn every day. 
that we are all the same. I've listened to people who didn't look like me, people I never thought I would relate to, and I've heard myself in their stories. Even though we have different wounds, different lived experiences, different circumstances, we all have pain. And we all want the same things, to be safe, to be seen, and to be loved. And I saw the power of stories. Through telling them we heal ourselves and others, through hearing them we remember the truth, that we are all one and that we are all connected. Traditional African society uses the term Ubuntu to express the idea that each of us is fundamentally a part of the whole. It translates to, I am because we are. And this truth is why I'm here today. Within the past few years, many people have come forward with their own stories of harassment and discrimination in tech. We have been shocked by some of the stories we have heard or read, including my own. So we have poured billions of dollars into data collection, new hiring practices, unconscious bias trainings, educational programs for people from underrepresented backgrounds, and other diversity and inclusion initiatives. And where are we now? We continue to hear about incidents of racial and sexual discrimination, vile incidents that are harming people and communities, we are not hiring more black and brown people, as is shown by Google's latest diversity in tech report. Some of us are even proudly advertising white-only job postings. And we are learning that leaders of our industry have been covering up years and years of sexual assaults. Needless to say, we are not in a better place, or at least not close to where we want to be. In the age of AI everywhere, and mass surveillance, and predictive policing, and tech as a solution to everything, and the severe implications of all of this on humanity, the issue of our industry and our society's homogenous and harmful culture is more critical than ever. We here in these rooms are the deciders of what happens to other people. Our decisions have real impacts, and that's why we need more different people in these rooms, because the future is in the margins. Our public shaming tactics and half-hearted top-down policies have not been working, because we are not addressing the root of the problem. We need to shift how we see each other in our relationships. We need to radically transform ourselves and our communities. We keep asking, how do we make the tech industry more diverse? But I've been thinking about a new question recently. How do we heal? How do we heal our communities and our industry? How do we heal our internalized racism, sexism, transphobia, and all our other harmful beliefs, thoughts, and behaviors? How do we heal the harms that were done to us and the harms we have done to others? How do we heal our relationships, and how do we learn to be whole and free together? It was a little over a year ago that I gave this talk where I called out the men who had sexually harassed me. And I was asked to give the same one today, but I realized that I couldn't. When I called these men out, I shared their full names, photo, and where they worked. After years of staying silent, I spoke up, and I was really scared. But the response was overwhelmingly supportive. Within three hours, two women messaged me to tell me some of these men had harmed them too. I really felt like I'd done the right thing. I was a warrior, fighting for equality, giving a voice to the voiceless, telling others who'd been victims of discrimination and harassment, I can speak up so you can speak up too. Or at the very least, this is messed up and you are not alone. And hopefully inspiring people to make a change in their communities so that others don't have to go through the same thing. And I know that some positive things have come from me doing this, but now I also see how some harm has come from this. When these incidents happened, I was so scared and so angry. I felt completely powerless. And the only way I knew how to regain my power was to take power away from those who had taken mine. And that's why I resorted to public shaming them. I did it in the name of truth and justice, but I also did it out of revenge. But public shaming is not the way that we heal as a community, and that's not the way that I heal. Because when I harm others, I harm myself. And hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. When these incidents of harassment happened early on in my career, it created a deep wound in me. I began to fear men in tech. A story was written in my mind that I will continue to be hurt by people who look like this. But this doesn't have to be the truth. There are many stories and beliefs I've learned throughout my life. They came from various places. When I was little, I learned that I'm not worthy of love unless I'm perfect unless I'm the best at everything. That's why I never gave up in my pursuit for success and greatness in software. I couldn't give up, even if it was harming me. When I started coding, I learned the story that tech is a meritocracy, and if I'm good at code, then I will succeed. And if I don't succeed, it must be that I'm not a good coder. From the media and my teachers, I learned that women and minorities are just less interested in coding, and white and Asian men are better at it. But something happened that made me unlearn that story, and I learned a new story 
that tech is not a meritocracy. Excellence in code can come from anyone, and we all deserve an opportunity to be a part of this community, this industry, and to co-create the future. We all deserve to be here, to be safe, and to thrive, no matter what body we were born in. We have all learned stories. We learn stories about what it means to be a woman, what it means to be a man, what gender is, who is a criminal, and who is not deserving of being treated like a human. We didn't choose these stories. We learned them from our parents, from our teachers, from our friends, from the media, and from society. But we can unlearn these stories, and we can choose to learn new ones. The story of who is a programmer was created in the 1980s. Women invented computer science and were the first programmers. In the 80s, there was a big drop in women programming. That's when personal computers started showing up. Personal computers were basically toys, so companies decided to market them to men and boys. And this idea that computers are for boys became the story we told ourselves about computers. It defined who geeks were. The image of the boy genius programmer emerged, and this led to where we are now, a place where the story is so old and so strong that we can't tell it's not the truth, and we can't tell where it came from. And so we treat each other like this. But this is just a story. And now that we're aware of it, we can unlearn it. But being aware isn't enough. Changing our behaviors, thoughts, and beliefs takes work. The stories we've learned about who belongs in our industry and who gets to succeed are like air we have been breathing in for a very long time. Toxic, poisonous air. And because these stories have been there for so long, it will take time to rewrite them. These are the most traveled neural paths in our brains, but we can travel new ones. What if instead of seeing our internalized racism, sexism, etc., as shameful flaws that we want to hide or ignore, we saw them as wounds we need to heal, stories to unlearn? What if we were given the support we needed to do this, to learn about these structures of oppression and reflect on how they've impacted our lives and those of the people around us and share about it with each other? What if we were given the space to practice mindfulness and self-compassion so that we could change our thoughts, the space to mess up and try again to do better tomorrow? What if we were given the support we needed to do the hard inner work it takes to unlearn these harmful stories and write our own stories? What if we didn't live in fear of being discovered, but in mutual support? We could go to a group of people who are going through the same journey and be honest about our fears, our challenges, and our shame. These types of circles exist. Men's healing groups, working to end sexual violence, white people against white supremacy groups. What if when harm happened in our communities, instead of ignoring, silencing, shaming, and exiling, we were accountable to each other? We shared the responsibility for our collective well-being. What if when harm happened, we saw it as a collective failure and a collective opportunity and centered the needs of the people impacted, asked those who were harmed, how do you feel and what do you need? How can we make things right? And then held those who caused harm accountable for doing so and then gave them what they need to make a change and heal as well? What if we moved from punitive to restorative? Restorative justice practices, which we've learned from indig indigenous people, are being used more and more to respond to interpersonal harm in the US, in schools, prisons, and now in the workplace. What if we measured our success by the strength and depth of our relationships, because we are all one and we all need each other to survive? What if we work together to heal, heal ourselves, our relationships, our communities, our movements, and worlds? We could make something beautiful happen. The Co-Cooperative is very program in the sense that it's bringing together people who normally don't get a chance to actually interact uh, very often. For a lot of our students, traditional job paths aren't necessarily an option because of their history with the criminal justice system. What we do is provide free technology education to formerly incarcerated and justice involved individuals as a pathway to equity. You know, technology and, and having access to information and being able to use it is really, it's like the most powerful currency allowing someone to tap into their own creative energy, their own ideas, and be able to sort of like magnify that just by learning some basic things like HTML and CSS is super important. These concepts and, and the language to describe is all new to me, and I love learning it, by the way, because when I'm out and about in the street, I just see the world like a little differently now. It's like, I've peeked behind the curtain. Even though you serve your time, I still can't vote. I can't get public housing. I'm not asking for a handout, I'm asking for a hand up. 
people that have been affected by the justice system are put at a big disadvantage in our society. They're discriminated against because of their form of incarceration. These skills are essential to help people get jobs and support themselves. So I think it's, it's a way of leveling the playing field. We pair each of our students with a mentor who is a professional software engineer. That relationship between the mentor and the mentee, because it's one-on-one, -on -one, you get to really sort of tailor the interaction really towards supporting the, the mentee as, as much as possible. If it's just you wanting to know basic knowledge of how to browse the web and how to check an email, it's worth it. If you want to go more in depth and learn how to create a web page, it all depends on what you want to get out of it. This is the opportunity for your future. If I really believe in myself, I need to put the energy out there. And you know, Code Cooperative, there's no love in this place. The Code Cooperative makes me feel a part of something. A part of something good. The Code Cooperative makes me feel extremely If you want to learn more about computers, if you want to learn to code, if you want to do good and you don't really know how, if you want to join a community of like-minded people who care about learning together and building technology to make a better world, join us. I imagine a world where we are no longer harming each other, where we all have access to food, shelter, education, and love, where the body we were born in doesn't determine what opportunities we have access to, where we aren't destroying our planet, where there are no prisons. I truly believe we all want this. This world is within reach. We have everything we need to get there. We have all of the information we need to create a change. It isn't a matter of facts. It's a matter of longing of having the will to imagine and implement something else. And we have to start right now. We have spent too long going in the other direction. And all we have to do is to start with ourselves. I truly believe that you transform yourself to transform the world. I have been learning a new story, that I'm worthy no matter what I do, no matter what other people say, that you are not separate from me, and that when I hurt others, I hurt myself and that my own liberation cannot come at the cost of harming others. This world we imagine is within reach. We can get there, but we can only make it happen together. Now is the time to be brave and to wage love. Thank you.